Albert Einstein, Richard Branson, Bill Gates, John F. Kennedy, Tony Robbins, Michael Phelps, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of industries. What else do they have in common? Well, they all have ADHD, but you don't hear much about that, do you? You know what you hear even less about? The successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm an attorney, not a doctor, a lifelong student, not a coach. I'm also the creator of Cortography, a patent pending system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your superpowers, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest superpowers. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka, and I wanted you to welcome you. I'm falling all over my words. I wanted to welcome you to episode number 50 of ADHD for Smartass Women. Today, I have invited Diane Wingert back to our podcast. Diane Wingert is a life coach for creatives and entrepreneurs who identify with ADHD. She's also been an adjunct professor with the USC School of Social Work, where she trained graduate students to become therapists. During her 20-year career as a licensed psychotherapist, Diane would see these brilliant, capable women struggling with distractibility, procrastination, perfectionism, and self-doubt. Many of them were diagnosed with anxiety or depression and had no idea that the underlying issue was ADHD. This included Diane herself. After her own midlife diagnosis and diving deep into learning everything she could about how ADHD is expressed in women, Diane embraced coaching as a more effective and empowering way to move past limitations and live life to the fullest. She's now on a mission to help other gifted, creative, and entrepreneurial women of all ages achieve their true potential by leveraging their strengths while creating ADHD-friendly businesses and lives. Diane, welcome! I'm so happy to be back. You are one of my favorite people to hang out with. Uh, Well, ditto. Do you know that our last podcast together, it was about cognitive behavioral therapy, episode number 33, just in case the listeners want to, you know, haven't had an opportunity to listen to it. It's in our top five most listened podcasts. So thank you so much for that. That's awesome. I'm so glad the listeners got so much value from it. Well, they clearly love you. I've had a lot of DMs about you as well. Oh, (laughs) yeah. And all good. And so this is why I wanted to ask you back to talk about meditation. I could find plenty of guests who could talk about just meditation, but I couldn't find anyone who was really knowledgeable on both meditation and ADHD. And I remember that we touched on this in our last podcast. So it's been in the back of my mind that you're our go-to gal for ADHD and meditation. Thanks. You know, it's funny, but I'm sure you'll probably agree with this, Tracy. The vast majority of people with ADHD, when the subject of meditation comes up, before you even get the entire word out of your mouth, they say, oh, there's no way. There's (laughs) no way I could do that. And when they're being really honest, they'll say, and I don't want to try. Uh, Well, I think I'm probably one of those people. And so I wanted to share with our listeners that we had a discussion in advance of you know, meeting here today. And the first thing you asked me was, you said, do you meditate? Have you tried it? And I said, I don't. I've tried, but it's never stuck. I can do maybe a few minutes if I have to. It's why I'm so interested in what you have to say about meditation. I also want to know why I should do it. And you have to admit that meditation and ADHD, it's an oxymoron. And I suspect that many people with ADHD struggle with meditation. And so then you came back to me and you said, it's totally true, mostly because we have myths and misunderstandings about what it is, how it's done and what we're supposed to get out of it. And so you said to me, it might be fun and resonate with your audience if you don't prepare and let me bust through some myths. You could call it meditation, why bother, or meditation for ADHD skeptics. I've converted lots of clients from no way to hell yeah on meditation. And so 
then we decided it would be game on. So let's well, start. Here we right are. Now. Game on. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I should probably tell uh, the listeners and you, Tracy, a little bit about my own relationship with meditation. As of now, almost 2020, I have been pretty consistently meditating for about 10 years. And I've only been diagnosed officially with ADHD in the last three years, although obviously I've had the traits my entire life. I've also raised three kids with ADHD and work with lots and lots and lots of people with ADHD as both a therapist and more recently as a coach. What I discovered about meditation didn't even originally have anything to do with ADHD. I happened to also have a chronic pain condition. In 1989, with my youngest child in a car seat in the back, I was rear-ended on the freeway and left with some permanent damage to my cervical spine, including chronic pain. So I would say I've been in pain for more than half my life at this point. After I had gone through all the various treatments and they ruled me out as a candidate for neurosurgery and spinal fusion, I started going down the road of all the alternative and complementary techniques, finally landing on meditation. My physician said, I don't know if it's going to help you or not, but we've tried everything else, so why not? And with that terrific endorsement, I embarked upon my first experience of meditation. Now, I didn't know where to find any information 10 years ago. I didn't know where to look. I didn't know who to talk to. And my doctor actually wasn't particularly helpful. He was really, I think, really fresh out of good ideas for my pain and just kind of sent me out to to find my way. So your doctor didn't actually have experience in that he had recommended it to patients, other patients, and it had worked really well for them. It was just sort of like a last ditch. Yeah, I think I think at the time, Tracy, it was kind of more like anecdotal. I, I believe his exact words, some people find it helpful. Mm. So I thought, okay, but at that point I was at, I had tried literally everything, including some techniques that are like Botox injections into my scalp and fusing of my nerve endings and crazy stuff. And so I thought, well, what the hell? It can't be any worse than that. So I was started looking for meditation classes. And I, the very next week I found, you know, the, in Starbucks where they have the community board, people can post things going on in the community. So I happened to see the very next week after this meeting with my doctor, a card that said meditation classes nearest you, near you. And I thought, oh, fantastic. How perfect is this? I wrote down the address, the date, the time. That was that. I don't think I really looked very carefully at the little notice because it was a group that was associated with a a Buddhist group. And at that time, after having been a a Christian for 20 years, I was in kind of a spiritual wasteland, you might say, where I didn't want to affiliate with any kind of spirituality at all. So I failed to notice that it was meditation as taught by Buddhists. Okay, fine. So I show up the night. And I take my seat and I'm just waiting around and looking around. Few people could come in. And after a while, the room started filling up. And it wasn't until the instructor came in and bowed before a shrine that I hadn't even noticed was there. (laughs) I was like, oh, crap. (laughs) I don't know what I'm doing in here, but it would be too rude to just get up and walk out. So I thought I'll just wait for a break and take my exit. Well, you know how ADHD curiosity works. So as I sat there and they did a little bit of teaching and then they gave an introductory education and meditation and what the benefits are and so forth, really kind of focusing more on the secular benefits than the religious benefits, even though it was a a Buddhist uh, monk that was teaching it. But I thought, well, I'm here anyway. I might as well just make the best of it. I'm not going to get up and walk out. So they began to instruct in closing your eyes or averting your gaze and just paying attention to your mind, not trying to change anything, not trying to speed up or slow down your thoughts, not trying to interfere with your busy mind, but just kind of observe the thoughts. And that was the very first instruction I got. Well, I didn't leave at the break. I actually stayed till the end. And I went back the next week and the next and the next. Something in it had sparked my curiosity. But beyond that, what I really loved was the permission to just do what felt right. If it felt right to just meditate for two minutes and then open my eyes, I could do that. 
If I wanted to meditate for 30 minutes, I could do that. But I would say, and that was really the beginning of understanding that meditation is not what most people think it is, Tracy. Most people think meditation means sitting cross-legged on a cushion, closing your eyes, and quote-unquote making your mind go blank. In my opinion, the only time a mind is blank, any mind, not just an ADD mind, is when you're actually dead. (laughs) So (laughs) there was no way I could make my mind go blank. As a matter of fact, when you first attempt meditation, it will probably feel like your mind is speeding up instead of slowing down. It's not actually true. It's just that you're paying attention to it in a way that you probably haven't before. And once you realize there's nothing wrong with that, I think your natural curiosity can start to kick in and create an experience that isn't exactly what you expected. I'm sure you're probably brimming with questions already, so I'm going to be quiet and let you ask. Well, the first thing I thought of was you said your natural curiosity will just, you know, take over. And so my thought is, yeah, my natural curiosity will start looking at, you know, the leaves and the trees and the people next to me and the clothes. And so what do you mean by that? Your natural curiosity. Okay. Excellent question. So what I'm referring to is, and I think for a beginning meditator, and for many people, this will always be the way they meditate. Many people prefer to close their eyes, and many instructors will ask you to close your eyes. And the reason for that is to restrict the amount of incoming information. Mm -hmm. We are curious creatures. We are always alert to exploring our environment. And if you block the visual input by closing your eyes, in some cases, you can just sort of avert your gaze. So you're just looking down at a focal point uh, on the ground in front of you by a few feet. You really don't have the opportunity to notice who needs to get their roots done or whose jacket has a thing (laughs) on it. You'll be able to just sort of kind of tune out the visual. And when you do that, it might, you might feel a little anxious at first because we're not used to it, but just sort of giving yourself permission to take a few breaths Breathing deeply does wonders for slowing down the mind, but at first it will feel like your mind is speeding up and then people will stop immediately because they know that the idea behind meditation is to slow things down. And when that doesn't happen instant frickentaneously, they freak out or they just dismiss the whole experience and think, I I just can't do this. You're always going to feel a little bit more anxiety at first, simply because your brain recognizes this is different. That's a good thing. As long as you don't think anything is wrong, you're just like, hey, I'm just here to watch what's going on in my mind. The key that really makes meditation totally transformational for someone with a brain like ours is that you don't engage with your thoughts. So what are you thinking Here's what here's here's the best way I know to explain it to people that are not familiar. You can say that our thoughts very very roughly fall into three categories. Thoughts that are attractive to us in some way, they're engaging, they're stimulating, we we kind of want to think more thoughts like that or just do so naturally. They're sort of stimulating. Thoughts that are aversive So it might be, I don't want to think about that, or, oh, God, why am I thinking about that? Or, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm thinking about that. So it's either attractive, sort of repulsive in a way, or neutral, like, "Hmm, whatever. And if you pay attention to what you're thinking about and try to do it in a way that's very objective, imagine, here's a couple of techniques that I use and have been using from the beginning. So if I could just ask you one question, of course, then, you know, my brain, I'll forget. So are you, you're still actually thinking about something. It's not, okay. Because I've always thought, no, you can't think anything and that's impossible. No, that's why I'm saying this is going to be some myth busting for you and for other people listening. I didn't want to have anything to do with meditation when I first heard about it. And this was even before I had a chronic pain problem and a really burning desire to have less pain, so much so that I was willing to 
do whatever it took. I thought it was, I have to sit on a cushion, close my eyes and make my mind go blank. I was so desperate to be out of pain that I thought, well, what the heck, I'll give it a try. But that isn't what meditation is at all. I I like to say that I found out about the benefits of meditation for ADHD accidentally. Mm -hmm. Because what I needed was to manage my pain without more medication or procedures. And what I discovered is that, of course, you're going to be thinking all the time. That's what the brain does. It's its only job. It does it well. And in our case, it does it particularly well. It said that we have something like, I've, I've read this multiple places, although I don't know how it's measured, something like uh, 60 to 75,000 thoughts a day, whereas a person with ADHD may have up to 90,000. I could say I could probably double that on good days. But there's, it's impossible to not think. So here's a technique that will help this make sense. Just imagine yourself sitting. And by the way, it doesn't have to be on a cushion. You don't have to be cross-legged. You can just sit on a chair. You can lie on your bed. You can even do this taking a walk called walking meditation. And all you're really doing is sort of standing back and allowing your mind to do what it does best, which is to think with one key difference. You're not engaging with the thoughts. You're not judging the thoughts. You're not resisting the thoughts. You're not getting up into the thoughts and thinking, oh, that's a juicy one. I think I'll have a few more of those. You just literally watch them go by like you're watching leaves drift past you on a stream. And I learned a technique pretty early on that I still use that is deceptively simple but super effective. There's a woman by the name of Pema Chodron. Mm -hmm. She is an American-born Buddhist nun, extremely well-known, has done numerous books and audio recordings and has lectured all over the world. Lovely woman. I believe she's in her 70s now. And the technique I learned from Pema is imagine yourself kind of sitting back and just observing the theater of your mind. And as the thoughts arise, you just take, you know, the stacks of post-it. She didn't say exactly this. This is my interpretation of her teaching. I imagine like a block of the three by three post-it notes, the ones that come in a cube. And as the thought, you recognize the thought, you literally take one of the post-it notes off the top of the stack and stick it on the thought and send the thought on its way. Another thought comes, you stick the post-it note. This stack of post-it notes, they're all alike. Every single one of them has a word. The word is thinking. So literally, as your thoughts go by, you just take a post-it note, stick it on the thought, thinking, 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 thinking. It sounds monotonous. It sounds boring. Frankly, it sounds pointless. But what it actually does is allows you to just take a step back from your thoughts. And so you can sort of see them as just a thing. They're just something that happens. They're not important. They're not They're not sticky is the word that she uses, meaning you don't have to engage with them. You don't have to resist them. You don't have to fight them. You don't have to chase them. You don't have to fret about them. You can just let them happen. And it's amazing because as you do that, your mind literally starts to create a little bit of space between the thoughts. So they don't seem to come crowding through the gate one after the other, like a bunch of eager school children on the last day of school. You can just sort of imagine them a little bit slower, a little bit slower. And I've experienced this myself in a very powerful way that, wow, just recognizing a tiny little space between thoughts feels so peaceful, even though I have a still very busy, active mind. So Diane, if you have a negative thought, you know, you're beating yourself up, whatever, do you recognize that as a negative thought or do you just recognize that as a thought, you put it on the post-it note and send it on its way? This is why I love chatting with you. You ask the best questions. <laughs> this is exactly what you do. Every thought becomes equal. The principles behind meditation are the principles of mindfulness. And mindfulness is a way of being that is objective curious, 
and open. So you could say, well, I notice that I'm thinking about how much I hate my mother-in-law. If I'm open to that thought, it's not offending me. It's not upsetting me. I don't feel guilty. I'm just open to the fact that I'm having that thought. I'm kind of curious. I wonder why I'm thinking about that right now. And I'm not judging myself for having it. I just stick the thinking post-it note on and send it on its way. The reason why so many of us with ADHD experience anxiety, and I will say particularly women with inattentive distractible ADD, they tend to experience a lot of anxiety. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're not only thinking a lot of thoughts, they're judging the thoughts that they're thinking. And then that creates both anxiety and a desire to control those thoughts, but also shame and guilt for having them, what if you adopted the idea that all thoughts are neutral and they don't actually mean anything about the thinker? It's just the brain doing what it does. Do you see the difference that makes? I I just love what you're saying. Absolutely. And you make it seem so simple. I feel like I could actually do this. And I had written down, (laughs) my next question was exactly what you just addressed, but maybe I've got a follow-up question. I was asking, so what's the difference, or I was going to ask, what's the difference between mindfulness and meditation? And so my follow-up question after your, your comment about it is, what came first? Was it meditation? And then we created this mindfulness around meditation or, or is it the opposite? Well, I think there's probably some debate about this, but you and I both know, and you're half Japanese, so you probably know this even better than me culturally, is that most meditation practices come from the Far East where they have been a huge part of daily life for thousands of years. Now, Westerners like to grab a hold of ancient things from other places and claim them as their own and sometimes pretend they discovered them. So in the last few years, we've been hearing an awful lot about meditation and mindfulness and meditation practice and living mindfully, eating mindfully, the mindful way of life, all of this stuff. And, you know, of course, people brand things and market them. But mindful living doesn't have to be anything complicated. To be mindful in in a moment or to be mindful as your way of life and your philosophy of being is simply to encounter each moment as something you are open to, you're open to whatever is happening, you're open to whatever you are experiencing, you're open to literally life as it's unfolding, you're not judging what's happening as good, bad, right, wrong, you're not judging yourself for whatever's happening in you, around you, or your reactions to it, and you're always curious Why is this happening? Now, people who are really masterful at living mindfully, and this is probably going to sound crazy to at least half the people listening, (laughs) but a truly mindful way of living. And, And there are people who, you know, monks who live in caves and do silent meditation for years at a time. I have studied with people who will go on silent retreats for a year at a time. Now, the only way I could be silent for a year is if I was completely alone. But then I think after a while, I'd probably just start talking to myself. <laughs> you just go get a Wilson, right? A basketball. <laughs> exactly. I, you know, everyone I watched that movie, Castaway With, they were all making fun of Wilson and cracking up. I'm like, I totally get it. <laughs> I would have grabbed a coconut. That would have been my Wilson. Exactly. But the idea is you're living mindfully, fully mindfully. You've You've been able to develop. It's not control over your mind, Tracy. It's freedom to allow your mind to do as it will, as it does, as it will always do. I think suffering, in many cases, it could be symptoms that look like depression or anxiety, worry, guilt. A lot of that suffering can be dramatically reduced or even eliminated if we were not judging what it is that we're thinking. So a mindful life could, for example, you could be thinking a hateful thought and the next minute you're thinking a joyful thought and the next minute you're thinking a a sexual thought and the next minute you're thinking a 
a uh, grateful thought, and they're all equal to you. And in addition to that, whatever is happening in your life is also equal. So in theory, anyway, you could get a phone call that says you just inherited a million dollars and you would treat that news exactly the same as if you got a phone call that said you have a terminal illness. Now that is going to sound crazy, but, and I'm using a dramatic example, but the idea is that we can train ourselves to live in such a mindful way that we are open and receptive and not judging everything that happens. Now, where does mindfulness fit in? Mindfulness is a practice. I mean, excuse me, meditation is a practice and mindfulness is a way of life. Um, so if you're, if you're mind, if you're practicing, truly practicing mindfulness, are you always meditating? You are such a good interviewer. I love this. <laughs> they I'm just curious, together. Diane. Sorry? <laughs> I'm just curious. No, but see, this is, this is the thing. I think one of the, the reasons why people with ADHD tend to seem much younger than they are across the lifespan is because we retain a sense of wonder, curiosity, and playfulness that others outgrow. So these are just some of the traits that I love. Meditation is the practice. Now, a lot of people don't want to learn anything about it because they think it requires sitting down for long periods of time. And we've already addressed the fact that you don't make your mind go blank because that's impossible. You just kind of sit back and watch your thoughts and don't do anything about them. Now, the more you do that, the more mindfully you can live your life. I think otherwise, and here's the biggest benefit for someone with ADHD. We tend to be very reactive. We tend to have emotions that can be dysregulated. And we, you and I have talked, and I know there's been a lot of talk in the Facebook group about rejection-sensitive dysphoria. So let's use that as an example. Let's say that you struggle with rejection sensitivity. That means you're spending a lot of time in your head thinking that people don't like you, thinking that you, you know, said the wrong thing and now you're going to lose your job or your friend is not going to like you or your husband's embarrassed uh, of you or whatever it is, your thoughts. But if you could have those thoughts and be open to the possibility that They don't mean anything. They're just electrical activity happening in your brain. And you practiced thinking that they don't mean anything. That's why I like to combine meditation and mindfulness practice with the cognitive coaching that I do, because we have so many thoughts and there's nothing wrong with that. But if the thoughts that we're having are making us suffer, causing us pain, causing us worry, causing us self-doubt, causing us self-hatred, causing us to hold back from living our wonderfully beautiful full life because of all the thoughts we're thinking. I think we owe it to ourselves to experiment with whatever might help. Totally. And the reality of it is most of those thoughts, they're not even true. No, but it doesn't stop us from thinking. (laughs) I know. And I don't find it particularly, I mean, I'm certainly always willing to be wrong, and I can only speak from my personal experience and the experience that I've had working with people as long as I've been. But I think once people decide, I'm going to give this a try because it just might help. It's a tool. Medication's a tool. Coaching's a tool. Time management strategies are tools. I don't particularly like the idea that I should meditate. I know you mentioned that earlier, and I hear that from so many people. I've heard about meditation. I know it's good for me. I really should try it. I really don't want to. I just don't find should to be a good motivator for almost anything. So I invite you to consider a different thought that might make you more receptive other than should. I I totally agree with what you're saying. And I think for me, you know, I'm not a woo woo y kind of person. And so I think that, it, and I know I'm half Japanese, but pff, I was raised German basically. And so I'm, that's part of it is kind of pushing it aside because I want, I just gravitate towards things that are, are less about the woo. Mm-hmm. So 
So yet, as I am evolving as a human, I'm becoming more and more, you know, spiritual, I would say, in terms of willing to reconsider other things because they really do work. So I guess my question for you is, what does your meditation practice look like? I mean, are you walking through the grocery store and you're meditating and how long do you do it? And what do you suggest for, well, for both, you know, inattentives and then for someone like me who's just totally hyperactive and it's just the thought of, you know, calming down for like, how long do I need to do this? You know, and right. what does it look like? Where right. will I do it? It's one of the things I love about meditation and mindfulness practice is the flexibility. If anyone tells you, if you don't do it for 30 minutes a day, you're wasting your time, run as fast as you can in the other direction. There's so, so much benefit at literally every level. I have been able to encourage many, if not most of my clients to at least try it. And some of them have been very successful meditating one to three minutes a day. There are other people who actually fall in love with the practice and decide to do it for longer. I've had clients who set aside the time to literally meditate for an hour a day because they find it so incredibly beneficial. So it can really be as little as a minute. But I think the sweet spot for most people is between five minutes and 10 minutes. That is absolutely doable from a time management, obligation management perspective. It's setting the bar low enough that you don't get as much internal resistance. But I think sometimes with brains like ours, we'll then counter that with, well, if it's only five minutes, how could that even be doing any good? <laughs> the truth is, I mean, in other words, we're just looking for a way not to do it. Right. Excuse my, me. My practice is 10 minutes a day, and I have done a lot more than that. I've done less than that. I find that consistency is the biggest challenge for folks with ADHD. So what I tell people is that anything counts. So let's just say your goal is to practice meditation for 10 minutes a day, but there are days when that is simply impossible. Instead of taking that day off, thereby hindering your attempt to become consistent at something, you just do one minute. I have clients who do it on the subway with uh, headphones on. I have clients do it first thing in the morning while their cats are eating their cat chow. It's very, very flexible. There are people who can do walking meditation, but they can't sit. And walking meditation is just, obviously you don't close your eyes. <laughs> but you are, I mean, unless you're in a really safe place. But walking meditation is for those of us who tend to be, I'm combined type ADHD like you, Tracy. So I have trained myself over time to be able to do sitting meditation. But when I'm feeling particularly antsy and I need to walk, it's different in that your eyes are not closed. But I avert my gaze and I'm only looking at the ground just a few feet ahead of me. I now live in Portland, so there's a lot of nice walking trails just, just outside my door. And by not looking up and around where I'm getting the stimulation of, ooh, what's going on and who, whether people and, and animals and whatnot are in the vicinity, I'm just looking at the ground. And I'm very consciously placing my foot. So I'm looking, where is my foot going? And I'm feeling the weight of my foot on the ground. It was really fun to do this in the fall with the crunchy leaves. But I'm toning down the emphasis on stimulating my mind by just being very purposeful about the way I walk. How I even do meditation while I'm washing the dishes, because you just get in that kind of a meditative state where you just let your mind sort of spool and let it run out ahead of you. So I think the, the message I would like to get across is, is anyone is curious, and I hope you are, set the bar low, don't enforce any standards, and all you're really looking for is a few peaceful moments where you are slowing your mind down, and anything that happens is fine. You're not judging any of it. If it feels like your mind is speeding up, thinking. If it's slowing down, thinking. If it even seems like it's going blank, thinking. There's no way to do it wrong. And as far as tools go, there's a lot of great apps and inexpensive or free things that people can do to give it a try. Explain, Diane, 
about the thinking. Are you saying the word thinking or how, how does that work? It depends on the individual, Tracy. Um, when I first started doing it, sometimes I would, if I was alone, I would say the word thinking out loud because it actually helped me focus. Mm-hmm. And I would visualize if people are very creative in particular, I think where I would be visualizing my post-it note cube and my hand pulling one off and placing it on the thought and letting the thought float away. But it, as I got better at it over time, as I trained myself over time, I didn't need as many props, if you will. I was much more able to sort of get into that flow state. Um, but I've used a lot of different things over time. I, I, at one point, I worked with a CD called Meditation in a New York Minute, because that's literally how long the meditations were. <laughs> um, I love that idea. And here's another thing. I mean, there are apps like the Calm app. I've tried that. Yeah. Yeah. There's an app called the insight timer for a lot of, uh, a long time I worked with headspace because it has all kinds of different meditations. It's about a hundred bucks for the year and it has all these different packages, um, meditations to help you sleep meditations that, you know, about your relationship meditations for when you feel anxious meditations for grief. Oh, I should make this distinction. There's meditation and there's contemplation. Contemplation is when you decide to direct your mind towards a particular object, meaning a particular idea. So let's say for Thanksgiving, you want to contemplate on gratitude. So you just literally direct your mind towards thoughts of gratitude. That's contemplation. Meditation is kind of when anything goes. And for beginners, who think, oh my gosh, there's no way I could just sit with my mind, I would go crazy, then you should do a recorded meditation like Headspace, where you're not just encountering your own thoughts, you're actually doing a guided meditation, which is someone else directing the thoughts and you kind of just follow along. So there's there's a lot of flexibility. If you don't just want to be alone with your own thoughts, because that, that can be a little overwhelming, then do a guided meditation where you're literally just as best you can listening to someone else. You know, what's so interesting is I I just realized as I'm sitting here, you know, I have done all these guided meditations, you know, the I've used calm, I've used, um, what was the other one? Not headspace, but insight timer. Mm -hmm. I think that might be what I struggle with versus your type of meditation, you know, where you're literally just observing your thoughts go by like clouds with the post-it note and the thinking, thinking that I think I can do a lot better than listening to some other voice. Take me wherever. You know what? This may not fit for you or for anyone else, but I I have a hunch it might. And I think especially for women who have um, traits of impulsivity and hyperactivity, I think most of us, Tracy, in my experience, have a need to be in control. We don't like being told what to do. We don't like being directed. I I always say I'm, I'm, I like to boss people around. I can't have a boss, but, and I've always been that way since I was a kid. So I think maybe that factors in as well when you're listening to a guided meditation, because even though you're choosing it, it still in a way unconsciously feels like someone telling you what to do or what to think. So if that's part of your personality, it might be really wonderful for you to just do the kind of sitting back and watching. I also have another technique I could suggest if you want to give that a try instead of the post-it note one. You you mentioned the clouds. A lot of people teach that way. You just imagine your thoughts are like clouds in a clear blue sky. Sometimes the, the clouds are like fluffy white, pretty clouds, and sometimes they're like stormy rain clouds, but they're just clouds they all pass. Another one is, um, I, this is, I think, I don't know anyone else that does this, but you remember in the beginning of the first Star Wars movie where you see the words on the screen and something about a galaxy far yeah. from away and the words are moving away from you. Uh huh. I imagine all black, right? Black. The words were white and the background was black. Exactly. And you see all the like the little sparkly stars and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I would just imagine that whatever thoughts I'm having are words like that. And I'm sitting in a big theater and I'm all by myself and the words are literally drifting away from me into hyperspace. 
And I don't even have to read the words. They're just there. I've imagined my thoughts as like ticker tape at the stock market, all kinds of things. Because the whole point is this. You just want to get a little bit of distance between the thoughts and the thinker. That is where the freedom comes from. That is where we feel a little less hyper, a little less distracted, a little less anxious, and a little more in control. And to me, that's that's everything. You know, part of it, too, is that on these guided meditations, I didn't understand the point of it. Mm-hmm. Like, what was I even trying to do versus the way you've explained it here it actually makes sense to me. And of course, for our ADHD brains, if it doesn't make sense, we're not going to do it, right? It's we don't get absolutely it. absolutely true. I'm not a good follower, but if you answer my questions and satisfy my curiosity, I'll try anything. It's just that you're right. If I'm like, wait a minute, why? Wait, what? Why? If I don't know why, I cannot get myself to do the thing. But that's why it's, to me, it's wonderful to be able to have the time and take the time to say, you know what? It might not be for you. But what if it is? What if you just haven't been told about it in the right way? Well, I am, I'm actually excited to get you off so that I can try this. <laughs> oh, there's I'm, one more thing I should tell you. Okay, yeah. I just love it. Yeah, there's one more thing I should tell you. There's another device that I've been using for the last few years that I really, really love. It does have a little bit of a price point. It's a couple hundred dollars. And it's called Muse. And the the Muse is a headband that has brain sensing technology in it that actually monitors your brain waves. I I used to do neurofeedback for several years. And so it's similar in that it's kind of a biofeedback where it measures your brain waves because when your brain is activated, the brain waves are different than when the brain is calm. So it monitors that. You can have no sound, you can have like nature sounds, you can have guided meditation, you have a lot of different options. But the Muse device does something that some people, I'd say many people need in order to stick with the meditation practice once the initial novelty wears off. And that is that it gives you feedback that you are benefiting from it. And because the thing is, is that you and I both know that if you can't really tell if something's working, you're not going to stick with it. And so explain to me, Diane, how, how do you tell that that's working? Are you only wearing that Muse headband or whatever they call it while you're meditating? Or are you wearing it you know, throughout yeah. the day? So what I, I don't use it for just general mindfulness practice. Um, I use it for when I'm doing like a formal seated meditation. And I'm having some trouble with my knees lately. So I don't sit on a cushion anymore. I just sit on a chair or the edge of the bed and, um, or the couch. And I put the Muse headband on. It, it's sort of like when you put your sunglasses around your forehead. Mm-hmm. And um, it has an app on your phone. And you can set it for any amount of time. You can set it for a minute. You can set it for an hour. Anything in between. You decide what kind of soundscape you want. Um, beach sound like waves or desert sand or city, city sounds like you can hear like cars and people talking or restaurant sounds, things like that, whatever your kind of background music is. And then it monitors the different uh, levels of your brain waves during your meditation session. And then afterwards, you can look at the data and it will tell you how much time you spent in a calm state, how much time you spent in an active state and so forth. For people who kind of like to gamify things. And that's very, you know, it's a challenge for them to improve over time, Uh, especially the men clients that I have. They particularly like that because they want to know, all right, you've convinced me to do it. You've convinced me it's beneficial, but how do I know it's working? This allows them to track it. I I think it might be a little off-putting to wear it all the time just to see what the general (laughs) mindfulness is. But hey, if you're like me and you work from home and the only one that sees what you're up to is your chihuahuas, like rock on your bad self. Just go ahead and wear it all the time. Oh my gosh. I love that. Because one of the, you know, one of the little notes that I made was challenging. Yeah. How do you make this challenging? Because I, maybe it's because I always say that I'm a woman trapped. Wait, I'm a man trapped in a woman's body. I always need that that that. challenge, you know, and this is how you do it because 
So what you're saying is if you meditate 10 minutes every day, you can literally look at some sort of ticker tape and see over the weeks that your brain waves are calming down more and more yes. over time. Yeah, here's the thing, because I know exactly where you're headed with this. Because <laughs> you and I have a lot in common. If you make this a competition with yourself, you will have missed the entire point. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Sorry, not sorry. It, it has, you have plenty of other areas of your life where you can challenge yourself and beat your best time and all that. With meditation, what you are training yourself to do is to give your mind a break so that it can perform at its best when you're not having a break. I mean, 10 minutes out of your whole day is really a very small thing. People do journaling uh, for insight, they do exercise for cardio and for, you know, getting their brain game on, adding 10 minutes of meditation to your day, even if it's taking a walk, it's worthwhile because I think the two reasons are just giving your brain it's a, a brain break. But I think the, the other benefit is that it introduces you to the understanding that you have more ability to regulate your emotions than you think you do. And the key to that is by managing your thoughts. And what I mean by managing them is not trying to direct them or stop them or convert them from bad to good, but being with them without the need to do any of that. And I personally have found it life-changing. So you have seen with your clients and, of course, with yourself, that there is a direct correlation between those 10 minutes every day and your emotional regulation throughout the rest of your days or the rest of the time during the day. Absolutely. Because I think what ends up happening is that you know how the brain works. Like you, the brain is always on. The brain is always thinking. And unless we have reached the level of study about how the brain works and personal development and self-help books or coaching, whatever avenue that may be, most of us are at the mercy of our thoughts and a lot of, as you pointed out earlier, Tracy, a lot of the thoughts that we're thinking, especially thoughts about ourselves, are both negative and untrue, but they're on autopilot and they just keep showing up and showing up and showing up. And we keep operating in our daily life as if they're true. And I have found that combination of, you know, the cognitive behavioral coaching and the meditation is the powerful combination that allows us to break through because Otherwise, you're just going to keep having shitty thoughts and they're just going to keep coming and coming and coming. And if you don't know that there is a way to recognize those thoughts are not actually a part of you. They're, it's almost like they have nothing to do with you, even though you're thinking them. They are not true. And when you get a little bit of emotional distance from them, you have more emotional control over them. And then you can actually start challenging the thoughts a little bit. But if they're just coming at you fast and furious and you're reacting, 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 you, you never actually get to the point where you're like, wait, is that even true? Does that make sense? It makes total sense. Um, I'm wondering, is meditation like exercise in that it actually changes your brain? It most absolutely changes your brain. Permanently. Permanently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think about it this way, like meditation, you're actually using, this may sound like a tongue, a tongue tie, but meditation and mindfulness practice are basically using your mind to change your brain, to change your mind. Because yeah. when you can get a little bit of distance between yourself and the thoughts you're having, especially negative thoughts, you have the ability to start inserting better thoughts into the you know, play the player. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have even the awareness that you are not your thoughts, you are the thinker of your thoughts, you really don't have any way of dealing with any of that other than to just feel helpless and hopeless that it could ever be any different. Over time, Diane, do you find that the negative thoughts that you're having while you're meditating, they decrease? They decrease across the board, Tracy. Okay. Not just while you're meditating. I think here's the thing. We're all thinking all the time. And most of the thoughts that we're thinking, and we talked about this in our previous 
the Cognitive Behavioral Coaching episode, we're thinking thoughts that are just recycled, thoughts that we've been thinking for years, decades. Most of the thoughts we are thinking about ourselves, especially, are recycled thoughts that we first learned to think when we were children. It's why so many people think, oh, people don't change. Well, they won't change if they keep thinking of themselves as stupid, lazy, unmotivated, broken, whatever thoughts they first started thinking when they were a kid. And, you know, one of the reasons why I am on such a mission to reach more women with ADHD is because the majority of us didn't even know until much later in life. And we had the opportunity to build up lots and lots and lots and lots of negative thoughts about ourselves, which have been on speed dial for so long, we just accept them as truth. We, we don't even challenge them because we can't remember a time when we weren't thinking this way. So by being able to sort of push back, if you will, from your mind a little bit and recognize, just because I'm thinking it, just because I've always been thinking it doesn't make it true. But if I don't, if I don't have any way of sort of separating the thoughts from the thinker, I'm just going to keep on thinking them automatically because that's how the brain works. Not just the ADHD brain, every brain. The brain saves energy by recycling the same thoughts indefinitely until we literally say, all right, I've had enough of this stinking thinking. I need to create a new program. Makes total sense. Are you going to do it? <laughs> I have because I'm, I'm trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to do this meditation thing? When you are, you know, because I love the post-it note with the, with the hand image. That's mm -hmm. If that works for you, absolutely start with that. So you, you see the thought, you're writing it on the post-it note or sticking it on the post-it note, you know, with your hands, you're pulling it off. And then you're saying thinking is the reason why you're using the term thinking because you want to acknowledge again, this is just a thought. Exactly. And this is exactly right. You're acknowledging that it's a thought. You're acknowledging that what you're doing in the midst of the meditation is thinking thoughts. So you're, you're not trying to not think. You're not trying to wipe your brain clean. You acknowledge that what's actually happening during your meditation session, as well as the rest of the day, until the day you die, is thinking. But the idea is, and I don't have to change that. There's nothing wrong with it. What I want to do is sort of stand back from the thoughts and not be getting busy with them or judging them. What I would suggest one tiny little uh, thing about the thinking, and you'll have to experiment, Tracy, with what works best for you. But because especially when you're first getting started, your thoughts haven't had any opportunity to learn how to slow down a little bit. I would imagine the post-it note stack with all of them pre-printed in block letters. Mm -hmm. Thinking, thinking. So all you have to do, because if there's a whole stream of them like flying by really fast, you just grab the note, stick, grab, stick, grab, stick, grab, stick. If you actually had to imagine yourself writing the word thinking and saying the word thinking, you probably wouldn't be able to keep up with your thought stream, at least in the beginning. Just imagine they're pre-printed. And if you're having a just a massive amount of thoughts flying by, I literally can imagine picking up the, the stack of notes and just like flinging it at my thoughts as they go by. Um, because you're, you're literally wanting to remind yourself they're just thoughts. That's all they are. Then there's nothing wrong. Nothing you need to change. Nothing you need to do. Just thinking that thought alone, there's nothing wrong with your busy brain, can bring a little bit of feeling of peace and calm. Wow. That is the best description or explanation of meditation that I have ever heard. <laughs> I, I just... Is perfectly well suited to our kinds of brains because we can't do it the way it's, I mean, the way I don't, I can't imagine anybody wanting to do it the way other people describe, Oh, you just have to sit still for like a really long ass time and cross your legs and just make your mind go blank. I'm like, why would I even want to do that? <laughs> oh my gosh. I love it. I'm not getting it here. You know? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I just didn't understand the point of it. And now that I understand what we are trying to do, it's, it's literally about our thoughts. It's not about, you know, these guided meditations, they basically give you your thoughts and it just didn't make sense. Their thoughts. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I don't need any more thoughts. Why do I want to think your thoughts? I guess, I guess the idea there is with the guided meditation is that their thoughts will distract you. Yes. At least while the meditation is going on. But then what's going to happen when the meditation is over? And not only that, like we are already experts in distracting ourselves. I don't really think that's what we need. I think what we need is to be able to observe our thoughts without engaging with them so that we are not so reactive. That's what I think our need is. And they don't understand that I can think of their thoughts and my thoughts at the same time. (laughs) Exactly. While juggling and balancing your checkbook. Exactly. Exactly. And I also love the permission that you've given me to try this when I'm actually physically moving, because I think that's a big part of it too for me. I think I told you that I have a treadmill desk, which has been another game changer. And so if I want to do a walking meditation, I can just do that on the treadmill. It's not a fitness treadmill. The fastest it can go is two miles an hour, but that's like a walking pace, a very slow walking pace. So if it's like pouring rain or snowing or something, I can still do it. And it's kind of monotonous and you don't really have to pay attention to where you're putting your foot. So it's easier to go into that kind of You've been in a meditative state, even if you aren't a meditator, right? Like if you're just walking or riding a bicycle or something, you know, where your brain just kind of loosens up a little bit and just kind of wanders. I've always wondered what it is about gardening because it makes no sense, but I can but it physically does. It does be out in nature. And I don't think about anything. I'm just thinking about the flower or yes. the plant. It's weird. No, it's perfect. This is how the brain works. It's like when you are, and it it happens in nature. It happens when we are physically active. It always happens for me when I'm in a spinning class. I get to certain, and it's it's to the point now where I know exactly when it's going to kick in and I feel it kick in, where my brain just like unclenches and I get a little bit of endorphins and my mind just sort of, I almost think of it as like, It's like a spring that just starts to unspool or a a clenched fist that just relaxes. I just literally feel it sort of let go. That happens when you are gardening. It happens for people when they're uh, petting their dogs or knitting or anything that doesn't require your full attention and focus. Your brain just goes into a theta rhythm that is relaxed. It's not quite like sleeping But our brains are often in a beta rhythm, which is fast. So when we do something that's, frankly, a little bit monotonous and doesn't require any problem-solving skills, doesn't really require a lot of executive skills, your brain just can kind of relax and it feels very peaceful. I would say gardening is a form of informal meditation for a lot of people. And you've already experienced what that feels like. That is the feeling you're going for. I love it. I love it. I can't wait to try it. And I think I want that- you to let me know. Will you please message me later and let me know what your first experience is? Because if it doesn't go really wonderful, I want to be able to give you a little bit of guidance, um, what you might do a little differently, because it might not land just right the first time. And uh, I definitely want you to stick with it long enough to see the benefits the way I You have. know what's interesting, Diane? I know it will. That belief alone will ensure I- just the way you've described it, the simplicity, the what I need to be, you know, focusing on. I just understand now. So I know it will work. But I will report back. Yes, please. <laughs> no, you don't have to report. You are your own boss. You are the boss of you. But if you, no, decide you, you want to share, I'll be all ears. I'll absolutely. I want to share because you've been kind enough to introduce it to me in this manner after I don't even want to tell you how many decades, right, of trying. Mm. Well, you know what? If, if we don't hear something in a way that makes us go, hmm, mm-hmm. if we're lucky, it comes back around again later. Totally. Totally. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I want to ask you if people, you know, well, 
let me back up. Is there anything special that you're working on that you want to tell us about? Well, I'm going to be launching my podcast, uh, the Yay. Woman, which is coming up very soon. The uh, date that we're going for is February 6th at this point. I had to put it off because we decided to go on vacation for a few weeks in January. But I decided my oldest son was the first of my children to be diagnosed with ADHD. It seems fitting to launch on his birthday, which is February the 6th. And what is the podcast called? It's called The Driven Woman. The, the Driven Woman? Yes, ma'am. Okay. That's not, I've, I'm sure. I'm sure it'll be fantastic. And if people want to hear more about you or learn more about you, where can they find you? They can hop on over to my website at Diane Wingert Coaching. And if they think that uh, it might be the right time to work with an ADHD coach that knows exactly what they're dealing with, especially if they are creative, entrepreneurial, or just identify with those traits, you can sign up for a free 30-minute consultation by getting on the Work With Me page and scrolling down till you find the button. Perfect. And I will have all these, these links in the show notes. Again, thank you again, Diane, so much. It's such a pleasure to always talk with you, Tracy. Absolutely. So that's what I have for you, dear listeners, this week. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. If you like this episode with Diane, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too can discover their amazing strengths. And guess what? Your reviews, they really help in that regard. For me, they're like those little gold stars that we used to get on our work when we were kids. In fact, I decided that what I'm going to do on this podcast is I'm going to start reading one of these gold star reviews at the end of each podcast. You took the time to write them. I want to acknowledge your support. And so today I'm going to read a new review by Turn Dude. It's our first one. And then let me just take a second here to pull it up. And I'm not reading the whole review. I'm just reading part of it. But um, it's the part that I'm going to start with is... Through my mass consumption of all things ADHD and all media types and venues, the one place I continued to struggle was putting words around my feelings and struggles. So much is young and male-centered, which has been great for my boys, not so much for me. Tracy is masterful at translating female ADHD wiring into a clear strength-based path forward. I have gained more understanding of and therefore acceptance for myself through this podcast far beyond anywhere else. I've had so many aha moments and have yet to come away from a podcast without one. Tracy is giving me words to my feelings and understanding to my inconsistencies. And that is translating to internal strength and confidence in myself. I'm so grateful to have found Tracy. Thank you so much for your kind words, Turn Dude, and I am grateful to have you in our community. One more thing, if you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic idea for this podcast, you can go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com and leave me an audio message or reach out to me at tracy at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you liked what you heard, we sure would appreciate a review. And not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, well, that's also the name of our free Facebook group. Go look it up. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. We'd love to have you join us. You can also find all my details over at tracyoutsuka.com. Don't forget, I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week. <laughs>